So the session is Managing Migration. Uh, I'll, I'll read the title just to remind us all why, why we're here. Um, globalization uh, unintendedly facilitated interaction between increasingly diverse and geographically distant destination and origin countries. How do receiving nations manage migration and how can nations cooperate to make migration a success, both from a humanitarian and economic point of view. Now, what I'm going to do is just start by essentially getting the situation as the panelists see it. And if I can ask you, Pallavi, to start off. And there were a couple of stories which, when we were talking earlier, I'd like you to include at this early point. One of them uh, being that story of uh, the people at the gas station. Correct. So um, I had pointed out to Alex that uh, uh, there was something that had happened that was almost disturbing in the context of uh, the United States, and I think this comes from the anxiety that uh, people are feeling when um, immigration has become a topic, and w instead of migration, we address it more as immigration law in the U.S. Um, and um, uh, they were at a gas station in Montana, uh, there were two um, uh, people who were speaking in Spanish, and uh, while they were talking in Spanish, there was a border agent that um, uh, called them out and asked them to prove that they were U.S. citizens. So the assumption being that if you were speaking a different language, which was not English, that you were actually uh, immigrants that were there present in the country without authorization. So that uh, is what we're seeing. And this has repeated surprisingly even in New York, uh, where uh, you know some people at, in a restaurant were talking to another person in Spanish, and uh, one guy went crazy and, of course, went viral also um, by um, just screaming at them, saying that I'm going to call uh, Immigration Custom Enforcement because you guys are here illegally. So I think the assumption is coming from an anxiety that local people are feeling about immigrants. And um, Pallavi, just tell us. Uh, in 30 seconds, a little bit about your work uh, sure, as a lawyer. I will. So um, I'm a managing attorney of a boutique firm, um, and we're uh, catering to the global attraction that people have for the US, especially the highly skilled and the erudite. Um, and uh, we offer solutions that are uh, tailored to the entrepreneurism as well as um, investment strategies and corporate setup for a lot of people. Um, I am involved in the humanitarian side of um, uh, immigration as well, and this is more from a hand-wringing activism as well as just being involved and uh, letting the mainstream media know about what's going on at the border. So uh, I have fewer clients that I represent on the humanitarian side, but I'm involved just in speaking up and just uh, being involved in the U.S. Um, uh, on, on uh, in media. That's super. Um, if I can turn now to Astrid Scala Kuman. Uh, Astrid, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us about your connection with this subject and, and how, how it is from your perspective at the moment. Th thank you very much. If you allow me, and this we didn't prepare before, I would also uh, like to start with an anecdote um, because I have uh, two what I could call migrant children. I have two uh, children adopted from India 28 years ago. And uh, they grew up in Bavaria, so um, they are Bavarian, yeah, deep in their heart, that's how they feel. And when I travel with them together in Germany, in Germany, taking a flight, when, they, when we walk through the security, they are always addressed in English. And I ask him why? Yeah, everybody who sees a face which doesn't look sort of German in Germany thinks you are a foreigner. And they keep on being asked when they are shop somewhere, where are you from? Why is your German so well? And they would say, I'm from Munich. And then would, they would be asked, but where are you from really? Okay, so this is my very personal anecdote. Um, so I spent almost all my professional life in international uh, cooperation, development cooperation. I'm also by uh, my education a, a lawyer that always helps um, to, to, to look at things um, um, and structure them. And my, um, uh, uh, how I do, I refer to migration. I was um, 
um, mandated to support um, a working group of the G20, starting with the Turkish presidencies and through the uh, Chinese, uh, German, and Argentinian. And during the Turkish presidency in 2015, the topic migration came up, in particular the G20 country, in particular our European countries, uh, they got aware when, when it was uh, in front of their door. I mean, migration had been around all the time. So, and I was the co-chair of a task force on migration uh, for two sessions, and we tried to help to bring policy recommendations uh, into the uh, G20, because we felt the G20 is, uh, uh, since many of the G20 countries do have a stake in migration, being a receiving country, Country, uh, like Saudi Arabia, for example, nobody really talks about that too much, um, or um, uh, both, a um, uh, sending country like Mexico, but also receiving countries at the same time. So this is my relation to uh, migration. Thank Astrid, you very much. Astrid, thank you. And we will come back to Saudi Arabia later in the discussion. If I can turn now to Bibi Sata. Mark, um, Bibi, if you could just, again, uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your connection with this story and, and how immigration is in your part of the world. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. Um, thank you very much for being here. Um, well, my academic background is uh, finance and economics. Um, I also pursued some post-graduation studies in political science and international affairs. Uh, basically, my whole professional life has been in consultancy, finance, uh, and at the moment I'm partner of a VC firm, venture capital firm, uh, here based in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, we are a recent VC firm investing in innovation and majorly in early stage investments. Uh, in parallel, uh, um, I've been doing volunteer work since I was 15. Uh, and basically, four years ago, I founded an NGO which works in the health and education sectors. Um, we've been working with the oncology patients at one side in the health sector and in the education sector we have a project with the former president of Portugal uh, working with uh, uh, Syrian refugees. Basically what the platform does is bring Syrian refugees to Portugal and give them uh, scholarships for them to be able to conclude their higher education studies. And in this context I try to bring my two worlds together and within Blue Crow Capital, which is the venture capital firm which I'm partner from, uh, we created a venture capital fund specifically uh, to invest in refugee entrepreneurs. So this is my basically my connection uh, with, the, um, with the migrants, in this case with the refugees, but forced migrants as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> That, that, that is good, and uh, it is interesting that um, your work essentially sees migrants, immigrants as a resource to be invested in. Yes, that, that is actually the, the case. I mean, I just would like to give you a few notes on how we created um, this sustainable mind and uh, took it to numbers. Because basically when we speak about refugees, people tend to think, oh, poor people, we have to help them. Uh, it's more like a sort of a mentality of charity. Um, it doesn't have to be that way at all. Um, actually, I have a challenge for you, and I'm sure you all know these people. If you could just look at them, um, and see whether if you can recognize them, I'm quite sure you can recognize them all. Uh, and um, if you can just point me one that you just recognize. Well, Bob Marley, uh, Freddie Mercury, Albert Einstein, Jackie Chan. Okay, uh, all I could continue. <laughs> all amazing people, really successful people that were given the opportunity and were seeing as people who were worth investing on. So this is the kind of mindset that we're trying to uh, pursue, and this is the kind of mindset that we're trying to challenge people. Uh, if, if it's not from the humanitarian point of view, it's okay. Don't feel bad about that, okay? Uh, but look at the numbers. Challenge yourself and see whether this is really a good investment to work on. 
just to, just to leave some two notes, which will be more than three years into the pursuit of the sustainable development goals, no, not one country at the moment is on track to achieve by the 2030 deadline, to be honest, no, not one country. And um, this is an enormous uh, human cost associated with not meeting these goals. Uh, the refugee and forced migrants cause tackles around 13 of these development goals, which means that if country invested more on the, the refugees and forced migrants, and migrants globally speaking, uh, this could be a, a really high achievement for those countries. Um, and why this is happening? So how can we begin to turn these dynamics around? I would like to share with you just a few statistics and a few numbers, uh, which I think can be important to, um, for you to see. Uh, just give me one second. I'll tell you what, because this is just the opening. We, we will come back okay. to this topic. Just, but okay. just, just finish okay. this, okay? So, uh, before war, 25% uh, of young Syrians were in higher education. In Germany, migrants or refugees are responsible for one in five new businesses. In UK, one out of seven companies were set up by migrants or refugees. Mm -hmm. Since 2011, in Turkey, 4,000 new businesses have been set up by Syrian refugees. And in Portugal, we have already around 200 Syrian students pursuing higher education. So let's let get together and fund this fund. <laughs> Yeah, and as you've probably heard, in the UK, we're pulling up the drawbridge. And I'm done now. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Diego Alves, uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, tell us a bit about your connection with this subject and how you see the whole issue in two minutes or so. Sure. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Diogo. I'm from Portugal. Um, so I've, I've lived in nine countries all over the world. And... Um, this, this issue is, is something that uh, it's, it's, it's really something that touches my heart because whether we are in Malaysia, in Germany, in Dominican Republic, in, or in Portugal, um, we deal mostly with people. And uh, people are just that, people. Different, with different cultures, with different languages. Um, and, um, and what we are seeing now in the world is a trend that it's totally opposite to this globalization, that it's the main motto of this, of this conference. Um, and that um, should make us reflect a little bit. How am I connected to, to this topic? In different ways. So I work in three main pillars. The first one is technology. I work with big corporations um, here in Portugal on digital transformation. And I represent a fund of funds from Asia in Europe. So we invest in startups um, and we co-invest on Series A in late stages. Uh, and the businesses have to, get to be connected somehow with sustainable development. So emerging technologies that enable sustainable development, whether if it's energy, water, or other topics related to, that, uh, to the SDGs. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, part of it, it's I'm a director for the German Federal Association for Sustainability, and we do projects in the European Union connected to these topics, and actually one of the areas, of course, is refugees, uh, and how can we mingle, and I can explore that further, arts and uh, refugee integration. And the third sector is... Um, I'm an improv theater performer and, and, uh, and professional, uh, and um, I do that with companies and with, uh, with students as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, and also uh, there's a connection with refugees that I, I will tell you a bit about, about later. Diego, thank you very much. Now I'm gonna start with a nice controversial topic because as a journalist, that's the way I generally manage things. Um, and that is this whole question of, uh, there's resistance around the world to migration uh, and to refugees. Uh, it's one of the biggest news stories of our time. The question I want to put to each of you, and keep your answers short and punchy, is, is resistance to migration always really rooted in racism? Um, Pallavi, can I ask you to start? Sure. I would say it's um, economic anxiety, loss of identity uh, amongst the people that you see. And I think um, it, 
is part of it is racist, um, but part of it comes from some other anxious things that are happening for the people that are local that causes that reaction and is later perceived as being racist. Okay. Uh, Astrid. I think it depends very much on the social economic situation in a, within a certain society, who they welcome and who they don't welcome. It's, it's some sort of a social and, and uh, societal culture, um, depending very much, as I said, where they do come from. The, we, we had a number of discussions in Germany uh, um, because the, the, the incoming refugees throughout the last uh, years, in particular from Syria, they were Muslims by religion. So there was a big discussion. Uh, uh, you know, after the uh, Second World War, there were so many uh, um, uh, East Germans coming from, from, from former Eastern parts. So they were welcome because they were Christian. I think it was it's a hypocritic uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I, I think it's, it, it is related to, you could call it racism, um, you could call it anxiety that you want to, to, to keep your home uh, safe, uh, safe and clean. It, but you can uh, mitigate this uh, with a certain uh, policy and, and, and promoting a culture in, in your country to, to you, welcome them. You talked about how your children are yeah. treated at airports. The color of skin Yes. Is, a, is a part of this, isn't it? It is a part of it, but of, as I said, it depends from country to country because we have uh, 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 countries like the United States, at least <laughs> in the past. Uh, they, they are immigration country. You all, besides your, your indigenous, you left somewhere uh, 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 south southwest. Um, they all are immigrants. So um, I. I think partially it, it is racist, but only partially. There are, there are many other factors to, to be looked into. Bibi. Um, well, here in Portugal, I would say that we, we have a lot of migrants very well integrated in our society. Um, but I think it depends on where they come from. If we have the people coming, some of the people coming from ex-colonies, then I would say that pretty much integrated in our country. Uh, with refugees, uh, the conversation is a bit different um, because people tend to think that refugees will be a burden to the society and Portugal hasn't been, I mean now fortunately the economic, we have an economic uh, um, better situation than we had five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, but even though we feel that uh, in our society, still the word refugee um, is not very well uh, understood. So I don't know whether it's racism, to be honest, um, or it's just ignorance. I mean, people are just not well informed. Uh, and because there is no mobilization in that sense, uh, in terms of policy as well. Uh, because when this government took office, um, they wanted to uh, invest a lot in refugees. But in practical terms, um, the policy didn't work so well. So. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm gonna come back to that distinction between refugees and migrants in a moment. First though, um, Diego, your thoughts on whether or not resistance to migration is always ultimately an expression of racism? Um, I don't think it is. Um, I recently wrote a book that I brought to you, actually, it's called The Binomial Technology and Sustainability. Uh, and I really believe that the main reason is a lack of education or lack of access to education. Uh, because if people would have the same opportunities, they would probably be more critical uh, in terms of thinking about these issues. So I think it's mostly uh, an education matter. Uh, then I also think the discussion of migrants uh, and refugees is totally different. Because for example, in the European Union, we had uh, around 4.3 million people immigrated uh, to, to, to the European Union. And 
half of them are not from EU countries. Uh, and that's, it's, it's also super different whether it, if they are already European or not European. Um, and at the same time, I think also age impacts on this. Uh, because the perspective of, of people that are in the age group, and Brexit is, a, is a, an awesome example, bad example on this. I remember of being uh, invited by the WEF to, to speak with the government before the Brexit happened, uh, together with a group of, of, of Global Shapers and YGLs, and there was, a, there was a clear distinction on perspective of view on, on what would be the future of Europe and Britain uh, if we're spe speaking about people that are older than 50 or younger than 35. Uh, and that impacts a lot also on the perception of refugees and migrants as well. Okay, and yeah, we will come back to Brexit. I'm just gonna uh, quickly, uh, in fact, I will come straight back to Brexit. The, the format of this is gonna be for the next half hour or so, till about half past, we're gonna go through various challenges that are facing everyone who's in this situation. Uh, from about half past till quarter two, we're going to look at possible solutions and where things are working well. And then for the last 15 minutes of the session, I'll open up the floor and you can ask panelists questions directly. Um, so on those challenges, so we're in the challenges section. Now, you mentioned Brexit, Diogo, and, and it is interesting. Um, migration was the biggest, I would say, single voting issue on Brexit. And one of the, this sort of goes back to the point I was just making about um, is it racism or not? What, one of the claims that was made was that uh, once, we've, uh, once we've sorted it out, left Europe, we will be able to manage who comes and we can, you know, we can pick the people who, you know, the best in the world, the people who've got great qualifications, bring them in, they can still come, but these other people, the ones we don't want, um, the, the low-skilled workers, we'll be able to keep those people out. And, I didn't really understand the economic logic of this because I thought actually, you know, it's a country of full employment. The people surely that we need are the ones who are prepared to work as janitors, who are prepared to work late night in restaurants, who are prepared to keep the bars open, who are prepared to man the shops. And yet apparently those are the people that we, you know, the voting masses most want to keep out of the country. So you know, that's the question in the end. When we're talking about bringing people in uh, about migrants. What is the difference between migrants and refugees and why, why do we want some people to come in and why is there such resistance to others? And what is the difference in real terms between refugees and migrants? I guess this is the question I'm asking the panel. What is the difference between refugees and migrants? And, and, and should we worry when people are actually coming for economic reasons. Is it any different to fleeing political persecution when you're, you're fleeing economic devastation back home? Who wants to start on that? The ladies first. Falavi. We're talking about the difference between refugees and migrants. So um, in the US, uh, the immigrants, and they're the ones that are legally trying to come into the country, or even if they're at the border, they're applying for asylum. Okay, and they eventually will be given asylum, or if they qualify, if they don't, they would be deported from the country. The refugees, uh, a U.S. signed on to the U.N. Convention in 1951 uh, and is part of it. Um, there is a certain number of people that are allowed to come into the country based on um, something that the president decides and gets an approval from the Congress. So the number fluctuates. So just to give a perspective, uh, World War II got uh, about 650 thousand refugees from Europe into the US. Um, and that was, uh, again, right after the World War II. Uh, and recently, in 2018, uh, even though Europe is taking a huge amount of refugees uh, from uh, Syria and other disturbed parts, uh, US only took 22,000. Okay, uh, the president uh, in uh, President Obama in uh, 2016 asked for um, 
I like to say 80,000, and after that, for 2017, set the number at 110,000. That was then reduced to 50,000 by our current populist president. So, so the refugee immigrant uh, situation is a little uh, different or defined a little differently um, as opposed to how Europe views migrants, and uh, you know those are the ones that go from country to country. Um, here we have the law, some follow it, some overstay their visas, become illegal. Uh, we still don't call them, we just call them undocumented aliens for some reason, um, but uh, don't ca call them migrants. Lavi, thank you. And of course, the US you know, was known as the nation of immigrants. Um, just in 20 seconds, before I move on to Astrid, when did that change? Uh, with the 2016 elections and Donald Trump phenomena, uh, it changed. And I know you, I have 20 seconds, but uh, so from the uh, Emma Lazarus, the give me your poor huddled masses, right? Um, and, um, you know, welcoming the people here, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service also changed its mission statement right after the president came in from a nation of immigrants, which is how we're known, uh, to someone, and it's, it's a definition, and it ends with protecting the Americans. So now, just with that, there's a chasm created between immigrants and Americans, right? So they're not the same. Balavi, thank you. Um, Astrid, migrants so, and refugees, mi migrants are, and they, are they refugees. different? Uh, uh, well, um, we have, like, for everything in the world. We have regulatory frameworks and we do have regimes at the global, at the international level and of course nationally. And they all do differentiate between refugees and migrants. Um, my co-panelist already mentioned the 1951 Convention on Refugees. We have for managing the, the refugees internationally. We have a UN organization, UNHCR. We have the IOM, the International Organization on Migration. And we have since last year the two global compacts, one covering migration, one coming refugees. And we have uh, um, nationally, when referring to my to my own country in in Germany, we have for for those people who come, I could say under pressure, not voluntarily. We have a, um, a, a constitutional right for seeking asylum. That's the legal side, so to speak, with a lot of definitions and many courts and, and administrative uh, processes. But I would like to, to um, before <laughs> you, you close me, I would like to... Oh, I wasn't um, close you. I wanted yeah. to ask you something. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 yes. And that was, the, if, if the only way people can come to a country is by posing as refugees, even when they are actually migrants. Aren't you just forcing them down a road? They don't even it, want to go down. Well, it's, it's, it's a, no, you're, you're absolutely right. But I, I wanted to, uh, to um, make even a, a different uh, a point which is relating to that. Because even though if we have this uh, regulatory frameworks and regimes and, and uh, thousands of uh, uh, new jobs in the, uh, in the German administration for handling uh, the application, so forth, it's not going to really Really, uh, uh, will uh, resolve the problem internationally because we are here only talking about uh, a south-north migration, but this is not the the, the majority of, of migration and and refugees, whatever you call. It. I don't think the differentiation is not so important when we talk about this politically. We have about 260 million migrants, let's call it migrants as a generic, more generic term in the world. And most of them are south-south uh, 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 migration. And uh, I think this is something we should, uh, when we talk about this differentiation, we should look into. And we have not really seen uh, the masses of climate refugees or climate migration, whatever you call it, uh, coming, uh, migrating regionally, south-south, or may, maybe one day um, migrating uh, um, uh, south-north. So um, I believe, yes, we do have um, um, uh, regulatory frameworks in place, but um, this, this is not the challenge. The challenge is how do we uh, um, implement them? How do we act? How do we, as we see in the United States, uh, um, we need policies uh, to, to implement them. Uh, 
with a good spirit uh, and a humanitarian spirit that I would select. Okay, that's good. We will, we will come back to okay. that in a moment. Um, Bibi, migrants, refugees, is there a difference? Okay. Uh, I think legally, uh, basically, everything has been said, so I'm not going to go basically in, in legal terms. Or, or in my perspective, or the, um, the idea, I think we have to change at the policy level and at the um, action level, to take action, not diplomas that define what is a migrant, what is a refugee, what are their rights, what are their obligations. This obviously has to exist, it's a regulatory framework, but more than that, we need policies that take to action, real action. Um, and uh, I think uh, we need a mentality change as well, because in my, from what I've been hearing sometimes, uh, speaking about refugees, uh, is that people tend to see them with totally two different, completely uh, different type of uh, people. Uh, they see migrants, okay, so I, I see some people doing these comments. Uh, okay, migrants are gonna take my job away. Uh, because they're coming and they're stealing all the jobs that are available in our country. Uh, they forget that they don't apply for that jobs, but that's okay. Uh, and in terms of refugees, uh, the thing is that they think, okay, here comes a refugee, he's going to be a burden on me, I have to pay for him. So. The, I think the mindset is totally different when the people are thinking about migrants or people are thinking about refugees. And even uh, the numbers that you were saying, 260 million altogether are the migrants, there, there is a distinction then. People say there are 70 million refugees and forced migrants. So among these 260. So there is a difference. Um, yeah, and you raise an important point because often refugees can be in this sort of no man's land status for exactly. a very long period. In the United States, for a long time, they were allowed to work, but many other countries, they just um, stay there. they're just forced to do nothing exactly. for and a very long time, and, and they become controversial because they're being paid for exactly. by the population. They become a burden, and they are seen as that. So, Diego. I think it, this has to, to do a lot with context. Um, and if we go back to the decade of 90s, uh, Portugal, for example, adhered to the European Union back then, communities, uh, a European uh, community, in 1986. And during the decade of, of 90s, there was an unemployment rate of like 3 4%. And that was a, a really uh, big period for welcoming migrants. Uh, and I actually was reading one of the, one of the things on the book. And for example, former uh, former prisoners that were reconverted to 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 work in, in in traditional industries like petrochemical, welding, and all like really robust traditional industries. And there were former immigrants that came here. They started uh, doing uh, bad things and criminalized. But then society welcomed them and reconverted them and put them working uh, together with with the uh, with the people from 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 the country from uh, from Portugal. Um, I think the issue now is, the issue is way bigger than it was before, and it's way more turned into refugees rather than migrants. Because when we speak about our ex-colonies, for example, we are, we are speaking about uh, routes that are similar, although, of course, the context is different, and it's different, that, of course, if you're an Angolan or Portuguese, but there's, for example, the language, the language barriers are, are, are it's, it's, a, it's a huge obstacle for uh, migrants and refugees when they want to come to Portugal, for example. I was reading uh, some, some articles, and uh, Portugal only received 2,000 people in the last five years, and actually said that it could receive way more than that. Uh, way more. So our occupancy rate is way smaller than the one that uh, we were we had capacity to do it. And Germany, for example, only in 2017, there were 2,000, uh, 222,000 people that applied to go to Germany. Italy, 120, 28,000 people. Uh, so uh, context, geography, also the size of the country have a lot to do with this too. Um, but also, for example, out of these 2,000, 1,000 already left as well. Uh, and that's, that has to make us think also on what kind of policies we have in place to, to welcome these people, but as well, what are the obstacles? Why people are, why half of the people that came here 
um, left, right? And that has to do with culture, that has to do with uh, language, that has to do with it's a point of entry to other countries in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of things here that uh, it's, it's, it's really complex. Now, you, you, you raise a big issue, and I'm going to come back to it in the question after the one I'm about to pose. Uh, that we, we will come back to that, how receiving countries manage migration, and also you know, how bigger groups like the European Union uh, can and should regulate and feed into that process. But before that, I want to turn to Astrid, because she, she raised uh, an important point in her last uh, answer, and that is this whole thing. We think of uh, in the little bubble that I sit in in London, um, immigration, migration tends to mean people wanting to come into rich countries, the United States over the border, into Europe, into Britain. But of course, actually, that's a pretty small part of the international migration pattern. And, uh, and Astrid, you, you um, when we were talking earlier, uh, before the session, uh, you were talking about the migration into Saudi Arabia as being a very good example of a pretty unregulated uh, part of the whole migration pattern. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? And then I'm going to ask the other panelists to just chip in. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, to suggest to, to, to bring it into a more global perspective. It has been actually said um, last night, I don't know who of you were attending the final session uh, in the auditorium by Brian Gallagher. Why are we not talking more about migration as a global challenge? Because we have created this global marketplace and we are not maintaining peace. These are the two causes. The global marketplace is a cause for, for labor migrants, and I come back to Saudi Arabia, and the, uh, and, and the lack of uh, peace and stability and, and climate change uh, uh, are the, uh, the root causes for, for forced migrants for whatever reasons or from where, who is forcing them. Could be the drought, could be uh, a dictator uh, and a civil war. So um, coming back to Saudi Arabia, a, a G20 country, um, uh, I think they have a regulated migration. It is not so easy it, it, to well, migrate it, it, yeah, into this country. It, it's regulated I know by what Saudi you are, Arabia. What it's you are outside the international about. system, yes. isn't it? Uh, well, yes, anyway, they, they have bilateral, what is outside the international system? This is a good point. Uh, um, uh, there are bilateral agreements between uh, Saudi Arabia and, and countries in the uh, uh, and agencies, maybe also countries um, in the uh, Far East, Southeast Asia. It's the Philippines, it's Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, in particular for um, households, uh, maids, and, and care workers. And um, they sign an agreement. So far, it's regulated, and then they. They come into the country and they, they just have to give, give their passport to their bosses. So I would say it's modern slavery. It's not only in Saudi Arabia. I know this is happening also in other uh, places in the Middle East. It's happening in, in Lebanon. It's uh, to a certain extent happening in Jordania, but to a large extent happening in uh, Saudi Arabia. So. Um, what should, the, what should and could the uh, international community? I don't want to go into detail because I think all of you uh, can, can paint a picture what's happening to this uh, young women. Um, first of all, they most of the time have to pay a lot to be able to travel there. Yeah? And then they need to work for the first uh, year or two uh, just to pay the fee they had to pay to, to, to come there and then they are, uh, they have like 24 hours. Uh, um, they're imprisoned in a way. Uh, they, uh, but I don't want to go into detail because it's really, really, really bad. And a lot of uh, uh, human rights uh, lawyers, like, by the way, uh, Amal Clooney, who is from Lebanon. She was on your list. Uh, she's a migrant. And, 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 and they are uh, doing good cases for that. What could the international community do, yes, to, um, to raise it, to put it on the agenda? to talk. If you cannot do anything, um, the best thing is you start talking, yeah, and showing to the, uh, to the um, uh, global community. And we have a lot of uh, means and instruments by doing so through uh, social media, through social networks. Um, that's the first step, because um, 
I'm, I'm not so um, optimistic that migration, be it um, on migrants, labor um, um, migration, or forced migrants, refugees, will be prominently put again on the G20 agenda like it was during the Turkish and, and uh, German presidency during the Saudi Arabian one. So a quite um, um, modest uh, uh, and pessimistic outlook, frankly, yeah. Uh, Astrid, I, w before I come to the rest of the panel on this, I just want to share a story um, from some people who are quite close to me. Um, the, a member of the, 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 this family are half in the UK, half in Pakistan. And one of the Pakistan members of the family went to work in Saudi Arabia, and it was a, a laboring type job on one of the many new buildings. Um, had a smallish accident which involved an injury to his hand. And they have a system in Saudi Arabia where there are different hospitals for essentially different skin colors. Um, if you're Saudi, you go to a very good hospital. If you're white and Western, you'll go to a pretty good hospital, um, certainly better than most of us have at home. Um, but if you're a Bangladeshi or Pakistani, the hospital you go to is not good. And this guy went to the hospital, they took one look at his hand, and within, a f you know, within 30 seconds had diagnosed that the best thing to do with it was to cut it off. Now, he managed to get message back to Pakistan. They managed to raise what was a lot of money for them, and the, the, the guy who was his boss in Saudi Arabia was, wasn't a bad person. He did get his passport back. He was able to travel out went back to a hospital in Pakistan, and they were able to save his hand with a pretty minor procedure. His, his hand is fine now, but that, that is the plight of migrant workers in Saudi Arabia. I'll, I'll keep quiet now. Bibi, what do you think? Um, well, I think the situation in, in Saudi Arabia is, um, I've been to Saudi Arabia 20 times, and uh, you can see that happening in front of you. Uh, it's really confusing for us because um, it's not like the mindset that we live in, but these differences in the hospitals and the, the differences because of the color of the skin or your, nation, your origin nation, I mean, where you come from, um, that is a bit a situation of what you were asking back um, about racism. Uh, we have a problem of racism as well in Saudi Arabia. So it's not just a distinction between uh, migrants or refugees or what so on. There is a problem of considering that uh, the people coming from these countries are less uh, than the locals. So, but I, but I think the case of Saudi Arabia, it, it's just um, not comparable for, for example, what's happening in the Europe or US or I think it's different. We, uh, for example, I had um, a few years ago, I had a job offer uh, to go to work to, um, to, do, to Qatar. And uh, they, they gave me a paper to put my old personal details. And they wanted to know as well, I'm Portuguese. Uh, actually, I have two nationalities. I'm British and Portuguese. Uh, but then they asked, what is your ethnicity? Uh, so I said, okay, my forefathers, my grandparents were born in India. They migrated to Mozambique. My parents are Portuguese, born in Mozambique, and then migrated to England where I was born, and then I grew up in Portugal. So it's quite a, I have a lot of countries behind me in my back. Uh, I was considered Portuguese. So I had a job offer with a, a huge amount of salary. It was really huge. Uh, but if they classified me as being Asian, my salary would be cut to 10% of the, of the value, even though I'm the same person, okay? So, I mean, it's, it's really uh, complicated. Uh, and I think there is a lot of work to do in those countries. Uh, and uh, so, this is what I can tell you about my personal experience in, uh, yeah, in one you, of those countries. You say complicated. It's really complicated. I say racist. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Okay, you're good. Um, I want to tell you a story as well. Is, is there anyone here from Malaysia? Because I don't, I don't want to hurt any, okay, uh, any feelings. So I, I lived, worked, and managed the company in Malaysia. Um, and um, there is a, what I used to call a hidden caste system. Because you have the Chinese, you have the Malay, and you have the Indies. And, um, and my, back then, my head of sales was from South Africa. So, um, black. And we had very, 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 very much, a lot of situations in which, on a business context and on an informal social context, in which the guy in front of me was, because of being black, he couldn't enter in places, we couldn't close co contracts if, if he was alone. If I would be with him, and we tested, we tested even pitches on the phone and, and, and uh, live uh, meetings, if I would be with him, probably we would close. And the guy was much better selling that than, than I was back then. Um, and afterwards, uh, what we realized is that it was, there was only one, one explanation. It was racism. And, and I felt that many, many times. Um, the way we turned it around, the company was called Price Panda. We were doing a price comparison website for Southeast Asia. Um, we, embedded that, we embedded that in the pitch in the end because we were saying uh, we compare prices, uh, we want to digitalize your, pro your, pro your, your project or your company, and we are, um, we are global and we are like black and white, like the panda. Uh, so with, with a bit of humor, we turned it around in, in the pitch. Um, but it was super hard to face at the same time a totally different culture. Someone that was from another continent, another race. I, I, I really don't like the, the expression race. Um, and at the same time, all of this during the period of Ramadan, uh, where uh, people were uh, facing physiological challenges at the same time. Uh, so if you put culture, if you put um, the fact of us being from different nationalities, of us being in a total different reality and trying to do business at the same time, uh, this is super complex. And this happens uh, all over the world more and more because we are in a globalized society. But if we are in a globalized society, we have to act as a globalized society. And we are not doing that in many parts of, of the world, I think. Yeah, you were both migrants in Malaysia. And, and actually, I mean, this... This is a problem which, uh, let me give you just a 30 second story. A friend of mine in London uh, who is originally from Somalia, smartest guy you could ever meet, he's doing a master's at Imperial College in mechanical engineering. Um, he's had um, some already at quite a young age some success in life. He drives a big Range Rover, brand new. When he goes out, he's about to sell it at a massive loss because he can't stand the fact that he, one in two times when he drives down the road, police pull him up and check his papers. Now, I've been driving for 25 years. My skin color is white. I've been, in my entire driving career, I've been stopped once. And I had done something on that occasion, whereas this guy is a very, very good driver. And he, they're just pulling him over because he's black. And you can understand how that would start irritating quite quickly. Um, Let's move on to another key area of migration, and that is um, the children of migrants. Back in the day, it was mainly young men that traveled around the world. Um, we've seen some awful pictures from the US-Mexico border. So, Pallavi, can I start with you on this? Surely. Um, and you had asked me to share this, so I'm just going to um, do this. And this is a current picture from the US. And this just shows, um, uh, this is the US uh, Southwest border um, by California. Um, and um, these are people that were asking for asylum that were put under a bridge that slept on pebbles. And this does not seem to be a display of what United States otherwise looks like. It almost seems like a third world country as to the treatment. And this does involve a lot of children um, that are part of these groups. Now, this is a part of the Central American caravan uh, that has come into uh, at the border recently. But the images are horrific. Um, so uh, to just uh, go over what's going on in the US, uh, last year, uh, in April, um, uh, President Trump 
announced a zero tolerance policy, and he said, if you're gonna be coming at the border and uh, you have your children with you, we're gonna separate your children and they will not be with you, and this was supposed to be a deterrent to migrants uh, uh, or people knocking at the door uh, for humanitarian reasons uh, so that they would not, they would pass the word along and no one would show up. Um, so this zero tolerance po uh, policy ended up in 2,700 kids uh, that were separated. At this time, that number by the Health and Human Services seems to be 40,000. Okay, so the 2,700 is not a true number. Uh, they say that they've had possession of about 40,000 kids. Um, now, and I brought this because, um, and we were discussing this with Alex, and I said, um, UN has five definitions of genocide, and one of the fifth, uh, w the fifth definition um, is forcibly transferring uh, children of one group to another. So, so what's going on at the border? Um, uh, of course, uh, people just generally dislike Donald Trump, but nobody is going to be able to intervene except the U.S. courts, and that have happened. Um, and he had to because it was so unpopular. He had to shut down that policy in June of last year, and at this time, uh, he's saying he's not doing that. There was a court order that happened uh, uh, later uh, in 2018, and even after that, about 690 kids were still moved um, and separated from their parents. So that's what's going on there. That's good. I'm going to go anti-clockwise um, this time. Uh, Diego, uh, tell me your thoughts on how the children of migrants are being treated. And, and, and you can bring in other stuff. You know, education is a, another sure. key part of this. Um, it's, 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 um I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, there's a WEF initiative called Dignity Day. I don't know if you heard of it. Uh, it's one day per year, um, and in different countries of the, of, of the world, um, we go to schools and we speak with kids about dignity. Um, and we have been doing this for, for many years so far. And I, I remember that last year, we were, we were in, a, in, a, in elementary school here, um, and and we are speaking about Portugal, we are not speaking about the US. 70% of the class where I was speaking about dignity was not Portuguese. They were from Italy, Syria, Iraq, Moldova, like a melting pot of cultures of, of, of people. Uh, and these are not displaced children. Uh, now imagine a context like the US is living um, and I imagine integrating these people in the society with uh, being, again, different language, different culture, uh, different reality, and not having the legal support, first of all, and not having the right context afterwards to, to embark them. Um, I used to say, and that's one, th one of the things that we, we say here in the book, that we really borrowed this world from our kids. Um, and... Um, when we think about, even when, oh, sorry to go back again to Brexit, uh, there's this very impressive and bad chart that says the number of years that each age group has to live with the decision. Um, and if you look at the, the number of years that people that are between uh, 15 and, even 15 and 30 years old, uh, not even uh, the ones under 15, it's their whole life. And basically, uh, older people are deciding the life of young people. Um, and I really think we should rethink all this model because when we go back to education and uh, when we are kids, we are used to question everything. And it seems that when we grow up, we stop questioning and it doesn't make any sense. Um, so this has to do a lot with politics. This has to do a lot with, with education. Uh, and the rise of populism goes on the other direction, right? So stuff like what is happening in the US or, or in Europe. Like we were the other day at the, at the opening plenary. I don't know if you saw that. Um, but we had three completely different visions. We had the senator from Colombia. We had the minister of technology and, and, and science from Portugal. And we had the minister of uh, Poland. Uh, uh, so <laughs> we had basically a country that it's like opening to the world. We had another one that it's kind of in the middle and tries to, and we had 
Trump number two. Um, and, <laughs> and again, children are the one that's gonna be most hurt in the process. So we have to have the right policy in place and we have to, to have the right education measurements in place as well to at least face the situation in a better way. Are we gonna solve it? It's again a very complex issue. But at least we need to rethink the way we are doing it now and adapt to each case. Otherwise, it's gonna be very difficult. Do you know, the senator from Colombia gave me some cufflinks last year. And uh, luckily I put them on today because I ended up having breakfast. I felt quite pleased with myself. Uh, <laughs> breakfast with him. Um, Bibi. Okay, um, taking some of the words of Diogo, um, I think when we grow up, we don't stop questioning, we stop bothering. <laughs> um, because there is, there's one point that people just, I don't know, we just don't, I mean, we are so embedded in our lives and doing our own things that we just, I mean, we just stop bothering, unfortunately. But I, more than that, I also think that you were saying previously that we are uh, a global society. We have to act like global. I, I fully agree with that because I think that um, societies are trying to become global, but people are not global. Uh, so th I think this is where we really have a huge challenge, turning people into global people. But specifically on children and the education of and, the children and, of And this, this takes us to the, to the children level, because this takes us to the education. If uh, in our education policy we teach our children to become global citizens, then they will grow up and they will be able to have um, a global mindset which will enable them to create much more friendly policies and to rule the countries and so on in the future and in a corporate level, uh, in, the, in the politics level, in every level of society uh, to become more really, truly open people. Okay, uh, this, this, so I think this, it's the investment yeah. on education. It, it sounds positive, but um, in the last part of this of our challenges um, section of the discussion, Astrid, we talked earlier about education. You know, it's important, but it is also one of the most controversial areas because it's part of that whole thing of migrants adding to pressure on public services. You know, local people are irritated with when their kids can't get into yeah. a school because the school is full of migrants. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I think it's, of course, it's worth discussing what we should teach our children, making them global citizens. But when I think of uh, these migrant children, be it forced migrants or, or um, the children of ma uh, labor migrants, um, which we actually already have within countries, Somebody mentioned yesterday uh, millions of Chinese migrant children left behind in their villages without their parents, without good care, without good schooling, or if they are taken with them into the cities, they don't have access to schools because of this hukou system or whatever. So the challenge is a global challenge is not so much what do we teach them, but we have to get them into schools in the first place. I have some figures for you. We have presently nearly 50 or 60 migrant children. This is including refugee children in, in, in the world. And um, most of them do not have proper schooling. Even those who are under the mandate of the UNHCR, you know, with this fairly functioning, well-functioning camps and, and some schools, only 50% of these seven million um, uh, school-aged children under UNHCR mandate, only 50% have access to, to schools, to proper education, and only 22% of refugees in adolescent age have access, access to secondary education. So we, we have a basic problem to get them to in, into the schools. Can I just check? You said 50%, only 50% have access? Yes. That, yes. that well, is proper. A it's, it's, it's a little what, whatever, what is proper, yeah? Because there are, um, I, I was mentioning earlier, um, the bigger problem is not the uh, south-north migration. Because this couple of, 
I don't even think, hundreds of, of uh, school-aged children to integrate them in German schools. It's already a big, big thing and uh, heavily discussed. Uh, are five migrant children too much for a German primary class with an additional teacher, something like this. So, but we, we are, uh, I'm referring to more to South-South migration, where we have all these people from Zimbabwe coming to South Africa. These children just do not have access. And I just recently read an article, there are 3.8 million refugees now from Venezuela. Um, migrating into neighboring countries, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, um, uh, Peru, and and they they don't go to school either because the 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 the, uh, the biggest challenge is when these people are migrating, and I'm not talking about regular labor migrants, the the Saudi maids they don't bring their children anyway. They, we have another problem, social psychological problem because they stay home for many years, don't see their mother. This also a big problem, but I'm now talking about these children who don't have access to, to primary education because they are migrating with their parents. They are two months maybe in Ecuador, then they, they uh, yeah, I'm not so familiar with the uh, geography of Latin America, but um, coming to, to a close-up uh, region, Syria. They come from Syria. They first go to Lebanon. Uh, and and the, um, they don't go to school in Lebanon. They may stay there a couple of weeks or months in a camp, uh, but they want to, to proceed to Turkey. Only half of the, and this is, this is a proven uh, um, figure, only half of the children in Turkey, the refugee children in Turkey, and there are about three million, I may be wrong, but approximately, you never know, but this is approximately figure. Um, uh, refugees in, in, in Turkey, they don't have access to a school. So do you want my, my uh, solutions already? Or? I'm going to come to okay. solutions in just, so, a, just okay. a second. But I hope I, yeah. I explained how, how huge this is as a global challenge, because we, if you don't get them into school, all what you have suggested to bring them into, uh, into uh, uh, the labor market, yeah, they need an education. So this is, this is where the, the dilemma of this um, biography um, ending up being a maid in Saudi Arabia whatsoever or going to the ISIS or what have you will start. Okay, so we're going to come to the solutions Thanks. section now. And in fact, we're going to structure this slightly differently. I'm going to give you each a chance to basically put forward your thoughts as to what needs to be done. And let's chip in. I mean, all of you, if you want to react, come straight back and, and let's t turn this last part into just a, a discussion. And then we will come to questions uh, in about um, 15 minutes. But before we move on to the solutions, I just want to do a little straw poll. Obviously, it's unscientific. Uh, but um, can I just have a, a show of hands? I think I know what is going to happen here, but uh, I could be surprised. A show of hands, if you think, in general, migration, immigration is a good thing for the world. Panel, can you? Yeah. Yeah. Is a, a, and is there anyone who, who uh, would vote the other way? No, I thought it might be that. Now, <laughs> but that's interesting, isn't it? Because we are, you know. For the neutral, it's there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> if we like it or not. We, we, uh, well, yeah, well, you can't uninvent the aeroplane. But the, the point I'm trying to make with this is that we're a group of people who are very fortunate. We're you know, generally quite well educated. We're the sort of people who travel around the world, who meet people. We're all of one view. It's a good thing. Uh, we like to think that we are you know, helping to shape the world's policies. But as the Brexit vote, as the vote for Trump has proved, probably most of the population of the world, uh, of the Western world anyway, um, disagrees with our view. So uh, as part of your prescriptions, um, can you keep that in mind? And how do we share our understanding with people who at the moment are very hostile to this this whole subject area. Um, who'd like to go first in, in prescribing three minutes of solutions? And I will be quite tight on time, and as I say, do interrupt. Who wants to go first? Astrid? Yes, since, since, since I believe that um, access to education is one of the key challenges to um, if you don't meet that, we will not be able to, to integrate uh, uh, migrants and, and bring a better life for the, uh, to them, or what, what they um, deserve from a humanitarian point of view. If they're form, forced migrants, 
and from an economic point of view, political, economical point of view, if, if, uh, if I do not uh, um, educate the children of my labor force in my own country properly, they won't be a good, uh, I won't have a good skilled labor force. But, you know, I have, they will need social security and so forth. So uh, having said that, I, my, my solution or my proposals, uh, not a solution, it's a proposal I, from a um, global perspective, because as I said, I've worked for many decades in international cooperation as to, to bring this topic uh, of migrants in general, but also in particular on, 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 on children and education more in the central uh, uh, debate um, in, in the international uh, global governance. What do I mean with this? Um, I think um, humanitarian work and um, development assistance should incorporate um, the topic education uh, much more. We need educational infrastructure, that means money. It's a money issue, so um, multilateral development banks should, should focus on, uh, on that, and we need to have um, these topics high on the global agendas. If the G20 leaders meet, or if our EU uh, uh, members, if the G7 meet, um, so this is very necessary um, to have a sort of a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, action to bring migration and education migration uh, in the center of the debate. Okay, Astrid, so access to education and for children to be at the center of the debate. I, I, I'm putting this on my list for the next time a world leader rings me up uh, asking for advice. Um, Bibi, uh, you have, you, you're essentially working on solutions. Can you just tell us a bit about that and, uh, and the, the takeaways that maybe people can share? Yes, um, well, we, we already have in place uh, the, the global platform for Syrian students, which is already tackling the issue of education, but more in higher education perspective. Um, and obviously, I fully agree with you that we have to have structures that can help to integrate and bring these children to school, because um, sometimes even the refugee families do not value school properly, uh, and sometimes they're just willing for children to find a, a job and bring some income to home and not really invest in their education. Uh, so fully agree on that. Um, on the other hand, we have the Venture Capital Fund. Um, and this is the main instrument that we need to take it global. Uh, at the moment, uh, it's a very Portuguese initiative. It's being developed locally, uh, but obviously we want to take it internationally, and this could be a global challenge to bring uh, all the countries together in order to create this huge global fund that could invest in uh, venture startups for entrepreneurs, for refugee entrepreneurs locally. Uh, connect it to some local universities as well, which I think would be great, United States, other European countries, other countries, any country in the world. Uh, and we could really create an initiative, a global initiative, that could, uh, on one hand, invest in the sustainability of the refugees, because you are not giving them the fish, uh, you are teaching them how to fish. Uh, and this brings economic sustainability for them, for their family, for the children that then can go to school, so it, and for the host country that will get a new entrepreneur, for the university that will have a new R&D research project develop, being developed on that university. So I think it's a win-win from everywhere for all the stakeholders surrounded uh, by this initiative. So this is a kind of uh, a ch an invitation to accept this challenge. Uh, to create this global fund. That is super, and in fact, um, these have been the two most extraordinary statistics I've heard at the conference. One is, is that very scary statistic about how few uh, children of migrants are going to school, but the, the other was your much more positive statistic about the number of startup businesses that are yes, founded by migrants. Yes, already in place, founded by migrants. I mean, in, in just, Germany, just to remind me of that number, of five, just, just so I can write it down. So uh, in Germany, it's one out of five. In UK, one out of seven. And from 2011 until 2017, this is the last number that I have, 4,000 new businesses were uh, brought up by refugee entrepreneurs in Turkey. That's, that's worth remembering. Diego, you have 
actually two and a half minutes to okay. prescribe the, the, your solutions. So I think um, I will I will uh, fit in my answer in two in two ways. One, it's the approach. Uh, for example, on the on the German Federal Association for Sustainability, we turned the SDGs around. What we we believe is that uh, the beginning has to be also always a partnership for the goals, um, and only with quality education, peace, institution, and the right infrastructure, you can do the rest. So that's, that's the basic assumption. Um, then in terms of solutions, um, I think there's three main areas here uh, in which we can do more. One, it's technology, um, because we are using technology for everything. And for example, uh, the, um, the European Maritime Safety Agency, which is actually based here in Lisbon, they use all the type of technology to map the migrants' um, um, routes in, uh, in, in, uh, alongside the, the, all the, uh, the borders of Europe, and they know where people are located, they know where they come from, they know uh, if there is need for rescue uh, missions, um, and um, they know also what's happening in the, in the ships, and they know what, what are the situations in which there are, for example, human trafficking, which is something we didn't speak much here, um, and we should leverage this technology to bring attention to these topics to the public. So that's one thing. There's also platforms like, for example, a Portuguese startup called Speak, you, you know it for sure, uh, and they bring um, migrants and refugees with um, tutors here that teach them about Portuguese culture uh, and, uh, and also uh, they, they, they give them Portuguese classes uh, and they are also in, in Italy and in Germany, for example, uh, at the moment. Um, the other thing is, of course, education. And I think it's not only on a policy level, but it's also, um, I can give you an example of a vocational training we did in Germany with the Federal Minister of Berlin. Um, and we basically trained officials from the public administration of Berlin on what is sustainability, being migrants and refugees, one of the major things. Uh, and how would they integrate uh, policies for integrating refugees on their agenda um, for, 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 for action uh, in the roadmap on, on the public administration in Berlin. And the third one, um, I think it's um, taking into attention that um, this com this, these people come in communities. Uh, and when they are displaced, and I can give you an example of the application of, of arts to this. Uh, one thing we did when I was um, starting an, an amateur group was we brought refugees to tell their story. So we had refugees from Afghanistan, from Syria, and from Iraq. And uh, all the stories were very much what you were saying. Uh, remember a girl that she lost all her family between Syria, Iraq, Lebanon. Then she was able to bring her brother to Turkey. Then she lost her brother, and she was alone in Germany. Um, and what we decided to do was we partnered up with an NGO in Berlin. And um, we did a theater play based on the stories we heard from the refugees. And so we had the story of the kid that is in the school on the first day, she doesn't know the language, and everybody is mocking her around. You have the story of the guy that is in the, in the metro in Berlin, and then the guy comes and asks him, Fachkarten bitte, and he doesn't have the card, he doesn't have any documents, and so the guy is taken away. Uh, we have the border situation way before the, <laughs> the border of, 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 the, of Trump, uh, and we have just a scenic play on two guys that are trying to cross a, a border, a wall. And then we fundraise for these guys with this theater play, and we did this sometimes uh, in Berlin. So I think inspiration through arts, um, it's something that, um, that it's, it's super valuable because we relate to what is happening by seeing it. Uh, so I would incentivize people to, to support these kind of initiatives as well. So technology, education, and community through uh, arts. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a minute. Yeah, you have <laughs> <laughs> All right, two minutes. All right. So when we come to the U.S., we have a different issues than from the Europe, as we've stated. But I have some practical suggestions or solutions to give. And first is to even build up a, the infrastructure of the country to take in the uh, immigrants that are coming in, whether they're asylum seekers or whatever. Uh, is um, uh, their goal to come into the country. I think U.S. is currently lacking a physical um, and uh, just a process infrastructure that needs to change. I mean, if it's hiring more judges or uh, you know, having more border agents or more facilities so that people are not sleeping under the bridge, I think something has to change with that. 
Number two, um, all the um, studies that we have, they should be publicized. So if we are talking about economic studies, um, about the uh, benefit that immigrants uh, bring, and uh, we see that in all of Silicon Valley, we have immigrants running startups and how well they do. Um, I think those are the studies that should be um, published so that everybody can understand them, and they should not be based on um, the politics of news. It should be literally uh, there for anyone to assess. Uh, then I have um, educating, and I'm talking about educating not only in the origin countries of where the immigrants come from, but educating in the uh, parts of, say, the US, which has not gotten um, enough growth. So. If there are people who are out of jobs, they're going to look at the immigrants and they're going to blame them. They're not going to be happy with uh, them being allowed to assimilate. Um, so you have to get them into the workforce and you have to get them to whether you kind of do it for free or however you do it, the government has to take it on so that they can train their present workforce. And the other part would be investing. Now, investing would be going towards, from the government standpoint, investing in countries. So US gives um, to three um, Central American nations, um, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, about $450 million in aid. And it goes to NGOs that are supposed to kind of make things a little better there locally. I think that needs to be monitored. As a stick, uh, uh, President Trump just recently said that he's going to take away that aid from all these countries. Um, but it's basically uh, money to try and stop people coming, isn't it? That's, it, that's it's, in it's truth. Settle, it, uh, it may be that, but it is also to stop crime there. Uh, it's also to educate people there. So there is uh, some part of this. And I think some responsibility that corporations take in the private sector for going and investing in countries like that. So uh, there is, uh, right now, there's been a lot of news about a plant that goes from the US to Mexico. What's wrong with that? If you're trying to tell Mexicans not to come into the US and to take away jobs there, what if a plant really um, moves, uh, a manufacturing unit moves to, the, uh, to Mexico and employs people there? That's going to pe keep people stable. It's going to keep people there, and it's going to keep them employed. So I think there has to be some shared corporate responsibility as well that takes care of investing in Africa. Uh, in investing in countries that require. India is a good example of uh, a developing country that got a lot of investment and growth also because of education of the local population. But I think that's what the push should be. Ravi, thank you very much and thanks for keeping it brief. I'm going to open the floor up to questions now. Maria, do you have a microphone or are we just using the ones on the table? Okay, that's good. Um, I was taking notes. That's a really lovely list. If anyone wants a copy, of the list that I've taken. I will email it back to you. My email address is alex.ritson at bbc.co.uk. You, sir, were first. If you can say who you are, who you're representing, and, uh, and ask your question. And we've only got 12 minutes for this, so let's keep this snappy. Yeah, we'll try to, to stay brief. Um, I think I just came back from a 360-degree um, video project from uh, West Africa when uh, portraying an initiative, Pan-African initiative, to create more labor around the cashew production. Um, what I, I think we are missing on the panel is, is really someone from Africa here, um, because that's, I think it's an entire dimension, thinking that. F funnily that, enough, we, we did ask for it. It just, uh, yeah, I don't know why it didn't happen, but it okay. didn't happen. Considering that 2050, uh, the African population is going to be as big as India and China together. Um, and at the same time, we are continuing as Europeans, together with the Americans and also with the Chinese help, to exploit the, the continent. Can I wherever, have your question, please? Wherever we can. So it, the question is how we can, I mean, this is a completely different dimension, how we can st uh, stop the reasons for migration to, to Europe and other countries, especially in Africa. How can we stop migration? How we can we stop the re that uh, that there are reasons? How, how can we stop to, the to reasons migrate. for migration? Right. Not, not that at the, at that the border, is going to be a hard one to answer in. Uh, but who wants to go for that? Stop. Sorry, stop I or change the reasons? Yeah, it could comment stopping, on that. Well, stopping the, the need in Africa to, to migrate in order to have decent life. Yes, I. I unfortunately couldn't answer the question as you as you may <laughs> guess, but I can comment uh, on that because um, the, that's because it's not that um, 
the European, uh, the EU and its member states have not um, understood that. And this is why they are pushing uh, um, a lot in terms of um, uh, increasing the amount of development cooperation since the last three to five years enormously. There is, you may have heard of the Marshall Plan for Africa. There is a, a compact for Africa, which the G20 have, uh, have launched. Um, and there is, is almost doubling of, of uh, um, bilateral development cooperation uh, for most of these countries. Um, people from Africa commented like, oh, this is interesting. You now get so uh, involved in our continent because you want to avoid that we are coming via uh, the Mediterranean. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge like it has been for, for many years for, for the development uh, uh, cooperation and, and for the global governance. Uh, maybe uh, joining hands with uh, China. Lately also Japan uh, uh, has invested a lot in, in infrastructure and creating jobs. Uh, so that would so be my, my to, comment. Yes, I, I, there's no answer on that. It is on the agenda um, uh, for the for the Lovely, rest you've got of the world. got an answer that you can yes. fit into literally yes, 30 I, seconds. And I would, yeah, I would say it is the corporate investments in those uh, nations that are careful and also educate the local population. That's going to keep them happy in their places if the goal is not for them to migrate into more uh, developed countries. I think, j just to be quick, uh, I think the African Market Union that was ratified two days ago is going to help dramatically to change that as well. Uh, because it probably will create new opportunities within Africa that are not available now. Uh, and only three countries even sign it. So it's really an African market union. And it's mimicking kind of also some of the principles we have in European Union. Um, I don't know whether you heard, um, a few months ago, there was uh, an African summit uh, bringing together some, I think, basically most of all countries from Africa. And they created, for the first time in history, uh, they created a joint uh, fund, investment fund, uh, born in Africa and from Africa. Uh, because usually you have investments coming from abroad. So this was first initiative of this kind uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it was, it's a fund which amounts 40 billion for investments only in Africa. Okay. So I think these kind of initiatives can really... If, if we're fast, we'll get three more questions in. Um, David, at the back of the room, again, introduce yourself and, and straight to your question. Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm talking about my experience in Saudi Arabia. I worked there for about... Four Sorry, I actually, I pointed at David. I will come to you in a moment. Thank you, David. Uh, David Wu from um, Atlanta, Georgia in the US. Um, so we've uh, had this experience with politicians um, having the microphone uh, talking about migrations and immigration um, and, and the negative sides of that. And even though everyone in this room is a great supporter, that's not true with the general public as, as was discussed on the panel. Um, we have these great stats about how um, migrants are, are, are adding to economies. Um, my question is, uh, but the, do those stats reach the, the people? Uh, what, when I talk about, I come from a migrant family, we actually, um, we, we immigrate across the world um, with very little. And um, when I talk to others about what the positives of migration or globalization um, and migrants are, uh, it's, they come back with, oh, but so-and-so got shot, or so-and-so was a migrant and, and committed a crime. And, and these personal stories are much more visceral. I'm wondering if we, uh, the panel can talk about how maybe we can change that, uh, because the numbers, the stats, don't seem to be reaching the people. That's good. These, so these uh, it, 15 seconds each. Why aren't the statistics of, of success? Why aren't they being understood by the population? I think it's a, what's a more compelling story, and I'd like to point to the media at that point. I, I don't think that that's something that anyone's um, 
taking on to educate people about. So we're discussing about the panic at the border and how we're not being able to cope. And I think it's just the more um, sensationalism of the stories that make it, and especially I'm talking about uh, you know, the main channels that reach uh, uh, on cable in the US, Fox, CNN, all of that. So we're talking about different uh, um, uh, things, but we're really not focusing on the positive of it. So, and I think that's shortly, I think it's responsibility to publicly educate everyone and whoever in whatever form can do that, radio sh talk show host, whoever it is. But I think it's all colored by politics. So unfortunately, uh, no one can keep their own thoughts out of um, reporting the facts. Well, no, we just report the facts. Don't shoot the yes. messenger. Um, Astrid, um, 15 very, seconds. Very, sh very, very brief. Um, yes, I do agree. Um, it's, it's a media uh, thing. We, uh, Western media do tend to, um, to bring the negative story. I think we have to start um, locally. Um, in education, at schools, in the local communities, because the, the good examples and the narratives are created in the, in the communities, in the neighborhood, where, where people talk and interact and in a personal manner and, and where we can reach, uh, let's say, the people uh, at the ground. Thank you. It's that famous newspaper, The Good News. It lasted one edition. They knew it was going to close. They couldn't even put that in because it was bad news. It's a true story. Uh, Bibi. Um, I think that uh, maybe the second generation of migrants um, can do a little bit of that job as well. I mean, create some initiatives. Uh, I know that sometimes I, I'm, I come from a migrant family as well, and sometimes uh, we just want to have a normal life. I mean, just uh, we don't have to keep on uh, proving that we are normal people, adding value to the society. We're worth it, okay? Uh, I understand that, but maybe... Um, we just have to work on that and try to change cultures and mentalities and show that we are just the same and looking for the same things. Okay, you've got 10 seconds, do you? Uh, I think it's a media issue. I'm glad we have someone from BBC, not from Fox here, for example. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's really, it's like with sustainability, right? So if we hear uh, of, or if we read uh, some news about the amount of plastic that was found in a whale, uh, maybe we should also give to the public the stories of initiatives that are happening all over the world of marine litter collection and usage of technology to battle that problem on a large scale. But those news are many times not very well promoted to the public. So it's really like there's a bad story, uh, or there's a, as, as you were saying, sens sensational story, but at the same time, media should promote good practices. The media doesn't do that. The, media, the news, it, you do not want your company on the news. If your company's on the news, it's because something's gone wrong. That's, yes. that's the truth, that's how news works. If anyone ever wants advice on a story, you've got my email address, alex.ritson at bbc.co.uk. I'm always ready to talk and advise people from Harassus. It's, you know, it's a privilege to be here. We should all be helping each other. I've got time for one more question, but you've got to keep it very tight, and it will be 15 seconds each. Okay, I want to talk about the legal rights of migrants, especially in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I work as a general counsel for a large construction company in Saudi Arabia from 1979 to 1984. And we had about 8,000 employees, and 7,000 of them were from Asia. And they, if they come to work, they have to pay about $500 to a broker. And then I found out that the human resource manager, as well as the managing, company, the managing director of the company, were fleecing these employees of 50 reals a month. And when I inquire about it, because I made an investigation, and my boss told me, it's none of your damn business. That's, and that's now, Saudi, Saudi OJ, and this is a story for the media, Saudi OJ, they got all their money from the government, and yet they left 17,000 employees without any compensation for their salaries. Okay, it's not really a question, but we appreciate you making the point. You've got 10 seconds to ask it, and they've got 10 Just seconds additional, each. Additional, uh, very positive information from Far East Tokyo. <laughs> we just, our uh, government just decided that open, more open for immigration this month, and uh, we are expecting half million people's immigration by 2025. Yeah, and that's yeah, been yeah, a, yeah. historically, so, yeah, yes. your um, question in five seconds. 
five seconds. And so, do you think uh, that the Japan, Japan is good good place uh, for immigration for, from the, for, uh, because it's too far from Europe and uh, Africa? But but we are very uh, uh, changing many many uh, things, especially uh, the service area. We have a lot uh, of. I can, I, can, I can answer. I think uh, Japan should be a very good place for it. Why? Because you have the most uh, aged population in the world. So that means that you need to bring young people in and you need to have policies to attract young people to stay. And last word to ask. Very Astrid. happy that uh, Japan woke up. Japan decided that in the G20, migration should be not a topic, but change the task force on migration into aging population. So I'm very happy about this news. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel.